being recorded. Okay, now that we have the report on, do you want to do the prayers, Matthew? I do. Thanks. Pull those up. One second. Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed. Supreme One, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed. Supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings and go for refuge. When you chief of humans were born, you took seven steps on this great earth and you said, I am supreme in this world. To you who are wise at that time, I prostrate. Completely pure body, supremely fine form, ocean of wisdom like a golden mountain, fame that blazes in the three worlds, supreme protector, to you I prostrate. Endowed with the supreme marks, a face like the stainless moon, a color like gold, to you I pay homage. The three worlds are not like you who is free from dust. Matchless one, endowed with knowledge, to you I prostrate. Protector, endowed with great compassion, omniscient teacher, feel devotion like merits and good qualities. To the thus gone, I prostrate. Through purity, free from attachment, through virtue, releases from the evil gone realms. Unique, supreme, ultimate meeting to the Dharma that brings peace, I prostrate. From freedom, teaching the path, well abiding in the pure trainings, holy field endowed with good qualities. To the Sangha also, I prostrate. Homage to the Supreme Buddha. Homage to the Dharma Refuge. Homage to the Great Sangha. To all three ever devout homage. To all worthy of respect, bowing with bodies as many as all realms, atoms, and all aspects, with supreme faith I pay homage. Do not commit any non-virtuous action. Accumulate virtue and goodness. Subdue your own mind. This is the teaching of the Buddha. Like a star, a mirage, a lamp, illusions, drops of dew, bubbles, dreams, lightning, and clouds. Look at all conditioned phenomena as such. Due to this merit, having attained the state of the all-seeing and thereby subduing the enemy of faults, may I liberate migrators from the ocean of existence stirred by the waves of aging, sickness, and death. I take refuge in the guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. By the positive potential I create by listening to the Dharma, may I attain Buddhahood in order to benefit all sentient beings. May all sentient beings have happiness in the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free of suffering in the causes of suffering. Excuse me. <coughs> May all sentient beings be inseparable from the joyful happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from holding some close and others distant. Respectfully, I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind. I present clouds of every type of offering actual and imagined. 
I confess all my negative actions accumulated since beginningless time and rejoice in the virtuous actions of all ordinary and noble beings. Please, Buddha, remain as our guide and turn the wheel of Dharma until samsara ends. Through the merit created by myself and others, may the two bodhicittas ripen and may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. This offering I make of a precious jeweled mandala, together with other pure offerings and wealth and the virtues we have collected throughout the three times with our body, speech, and mind. O oh, my masters, my yidams, and the three precious jewels, I offer all to you with unwavering faith. Accepting these out of your boundless compassion, please send forth waves of your blessings. Idam, Guru, Ratna, Mandalakam, Niratiyami. The Heart of the Perfection of Wisdom Sutra. I prostrate to the Arya Triple Gem. Thus did I hear at one time. The Bhagavan was dwelling on a mass of Vulture's Mountain on Rajagriha, together with a great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagavan was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomena called profound perception. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokeshvara looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then, through the power of the Buddha, the Venerable Shariputra said this to the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokeshvara, How should any son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? He said that, and the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara said this to the Venerable Shariputra. Shariputra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom should look upon it like this, correctly and repeatedly beholding those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Form is empty. Emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form. Form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Shariputra. Likewise, all phenomena are emptiness. Without characteristic, unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shariputra, therefore, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no visual form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no object of touch, and no phenomena. There is no eye element, and so on, and up to and including no mind element and no mental consciousness element. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance, and so on, and up to and including no aging and death and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation, and path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non-attainment. Shariputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, bodhisattvas rely on and dwell on the perfection of wisdom, the mind without obscuration, without fear. Having completely passed beyond error, they reach the end point of nirvana. All the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifestly completely awaken to unsurpassable, perfect, complete enlightenment in reliance on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequaled, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering, should be known as the truth since it is not false. The mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared. Daete gate gate pera gate pera sam gate bodhi soha. We'll do that 21 times silently. Daete gate gate pera gate pera sam gate bodhi soha. Shariputra, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva should train in the profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagavan arose from that concentration and commended the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara, saying, Well said, well said, son of the lineage, it is like that. It is like that. One should practice the profound perfection of wisdom just as you have indicated, even if the Thagatas rejoice. The Bhagavan, having thus spoken, the Venerable Sharidevaputra, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara, those surrounding in their entirety, along with the world of gods, humans, Asuras, and Gandharvas, were overjoyed and highly praised that spoken by the Bhagavan.
Thanks, Matthew. My pleasure. Okay, so my mother who said she'd be here and then scheduled the date for this time made me promise before she told me that she was not gonna be here that I'd sing a song. Um, so I'm gonna sing a song anyways, because when she watches it, she'll know that I didn't sing a song. Um, so bear with me, I'm just gonna sing part of it, but you should know it. So please help me out and sing with me because it's fun, right? <sighs> Where it began, I can't begin to knowing, but then I know it's growing strong. It was in the spring, and the spring became the summer. I'm already messing it up, but who'd have believed you'd come along? Hands, touching hands, reaching out, touching me, touching you, sweet Caroline, dun, dun, dun. times never seem so good. <laughs> I've been inclined <laughs> to believe they are never would. And I'm going to stop there. All right. Uh, Neil Diamond was actually my first real concert. <laughs> so, yeah. There you go, Mom. I sang you a song. Okay, and it, 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 it's actually a really good introduction to what I wanna talk about, which is memory. Um, and so that's a memory that I have, but let's talk about maybe a, a universal memory that we can all sort of share, which is just about a year ago, uh, I did this really fun thing, which was the ice cream social. And it was a really, it was a day packed full of a lot of different things. Um, we had Jesus uh, and uh, I'm going to mess up the name, but it was the, the Azteca dancers and there was a lot of drumming and dancing and it was really loud. So that had a lot of impressions on people. Um, there was also a refuge ceremony that day and it was like over a hundred degrees. It was blazing hot. So there was a lot of different things going on that day. So if you're here that day, there's a lot of different things that you could have a sense impression of that created memories, right? And maybe that's just a day that, you know, stuck out in your mind for some reason, because, um, you know, the ice cream social maybe wasn't quite what you expected because I didn't just have fudge, right? I had basil and Tabasco and ginger and ketchup because, Right? Who does that? As Lama used to say, he doesn't say that quite as much anymore because I provided it and I did it. And, you know, there's just all these different memories that we, we sort of shared on that day. Um, and I really sort of wanted to talk originally about, you know, what I learned in this past year from that. But then I was thinking more about the memory. And, well, memory is actually really important in Buddhism. Um, and it's important for a lot of reasons, right? Monks memorize texts, and that's the basis of education in the monastic tradition is you sit and you learn and you memorize. And that's where you start is just memorizing the text. You don't even understand it yet. And it's not until you've memorized it, then do you get teachings on what it means. Um, but why is memory so important? Uh, well, because we forgot something. What did we forget? We forgot emptiness, we forgot interconnectedness, we forgot that we are not here, right? We've, we forgot a whole bunch of stuff and we have to remember what we're actually doing and what's not here and what is here. We forgot the illusion, we forgot that we can overcome suffering. Um, so remembering something 
is actually why we have to sit and meditate to gain the concentration, to gain the stability, to gain the awareness. And the Sanskrit word, um, Dirk told me how to pronounce it and I can't pronounce it anymore. It's ri, um, it's spelled, uh, if it's actually written out, it's usually written out um, like in the traditional academic way, SMR, uh, and it's cognates or you know, get a little bit more complicated at that point. It has a couple different definitions. Um, one is actually recollective memory. We're actually remembering something, like we remember the ice cream social, remember yesterday, remember what we had for breakfast, remember that we just sang a song. Um, but the other one that actually comes up and creates a lot of challenges with translation is mindfulness. So that same word is used interchangeably for both. So when we translate and when those translations happened into Tibetan and into English, we get some interesting challenges with, well, what are we actually talking about? Are we talking about the mindfulness, the awareness sort of part that we want to use in English of awareness and mindfulness sort of interchangeably? Or are we talking about actually a recollective memory? Um, because there are a lot of different kinds of memory, right? When we actually sort of break down memory, there's a lot of different ways to remember something. There's tactile memory or, or body memory, motion memory, right? When you're doing yoga, you remember, oh, I'm going to go into downward facing dog, so I put my hands out. Or, oh, I'm hungry, I'm going to go get peanut butter, so I grab a spoon, right? Because I love peanut butter, so I eat it with spoon. You know, I'm going to drive my car, so I unlock my door, I sit down, and I put my key in the car ignition, and I turn it, right? If you don't have your keys, you sit down in your car, and you go to turn the ignition, and you realize you don't have your keys, but you've already done the, the turning. So that's a type of memory. But there's, you know, uh, even cultural memory, right? Um, things like... Uh, statues or, or ways that we say hello on the phone but that we don't really think about oh hello ciao uh you know there's different things that we do there are sort of memories that we may not keep individually but are actually memories that are cultural that are anthropologically known and consistent um so there's different types of memory that maybe we don't think about that are really hard to find in buddhism and that's the other challenge, is that it's not a topic that's actually covered very much in texts. And how do I know this? Well, that's not just my own um, little short looking for this. Um, that's talking to Lamala, and it's actually some correspondence with Jay Garfield, um, who, who's much more well-versed in all of this than I am. Um, and just even in the literature itself, it's actually a, a complaint that Western researchers have had is that memory is not actually well talked about. There's a lot of discussion about past lives and reflexive memory, and I'd really like to stay away from reflexive memory. Reflexive memory is whether or not the mind can know itself. That, and that's sort of that awareness piece. Um, that's not a topic that I'm really able to talk about at all. Um, so at, at this point, are there any questions about what I've already talked about? Um, so, one I of the actually have one. Sorry, Karen. I was I was wondering, like, I, I have been kind of noticing that it seems like the same the same effort I put forward to hold the object during shamatha is somehow related to uh, the access I have to my memory. Meaning that if I'm right, so if I'm struggling, trying to grasp at what the thing is, I can't get it. And obviously, if I'm just not engaged, if I'm, you know, then of course, I can't get it. And I wonder, like, uh, if you have more to say on that, or if there's, um, like, neuroscience related to that, because I know there's a lot of debate about how we store memory or where like they're kind of confused about like where are these memories we don't have memory banks or ram like a computer 
Yeah, that's an interesting question. There is some discussion that I've found um, that when you're actually doing shamatha, you're actually holding a memory, right? Like if I am doing shamatha and I'm focusing on an image, that image isn't actually there, right? That's a potentially a memory or it's an awareness of something that isn't there. So that's where this gets really interesting. And, and the question that I'm actually curious about is whether or not there's actually a lot more of about like this particular issue and whether or not this type of memory treatment is actually more in, in like individual meditative instructions or texts that are, you know, harder to find, not translated, um, you know, individual teacher to student sort of pith instructions. Um, and the scholarship just hasn't gotten there yet. It just hasn't made it into the Western world. It hasn't made it accessible to us. Um, and I don't know. Um, the answer isn't, isn't that what the Abhidharma would cover? Well, no, because the Abhidharma usually does not keep, um, doesn't treat memory as a dharma, specifically does not treat um, that as a dharma. And that's actually, um, hang on. Uh, there's an article by um, uh, Padmanba uh, Jani, who, who actually covers that and the only place that you really find that is within Vasubandhu. Um, and that's actually sort of my next, where I'm going after this. But uh, specifically, memory states are not a dharma. So you, you sort of find them as consciousness aggregates, um, but not as dharmas specifically. So... Um, they're not really treated in the same way as you would think otherwise. So they're not. Um, right. So it, se it seems like with what you're saying too, what comes up for me is then memory, since we're holding an object that isn't there, it's like somehow a uh, past sense impression and then partially imagination and creation of the image or of the memory. I can't get into that much detail, Matthew, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, but Susan, let me go exactly where you want to go. What Vas Vasubandhu actually says is that um, memory is basically one mental event that brings about an, the existence of another. So that's exactly where he goes. Does that... Reply, or do you have a response to that? So is that saying then that you have the event of the eye consciousness um, observing an object, which then triggers what Vasubandhu is calling memory? Um. So it's, I want to say that it's a little bit different than that. Uh, let me see if I can just quote. Um, give me one second here.
Well, maybe you want to just continue on with what your talk was, where you were going. Yeah, no, here I can, it's just in the other book. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so. All right. Um, so where there are two mental events are bound by relation of cause and effect. Indeed, we do not say that one mental event sees an object and that another altogether different mental event remembers this object. For although the two occur at different times, both mental events belong to the same series. We do maintain that, it, we do maintain is, what we do maintain is that one mental event of the past, which perceives a certain object, and hence can be designated as seen mental event, brings about the existence of another, namely the present mental event, which can be called remembering mental event, as it is capable of remembering this object. The two are causally related in the same manner of seed and its fruit, because both belong to the same series. So that is from I'd have to backtrace that um, particular citation. They've got a weird citation system here. But um, so that's basically where he's coming from is that it's a, a series of mental events that bring about the existence of another, um, which is um, essentially the yoga charn position. Um, which seems to cause actually some issues for long-term memory, right? Uh, it seems to make some sense of, you know, for, oh, I, I remember that I just put the book down. But how does that work when, I remember what happened when I was 12. And that's when you get into sort of the, the yoga charn storehouse situation that gets a little wonky, I think. Um, and then also there's the, the whole situation of uh, in the Abhikosha, um, Vasubandhu does give the example of, you know, you can have an event that doesn't create a memory, and then you can actually recall that event at a later time, such as getting bit by a rat or something that injects poison, and then once you notice the poison, you can recall the event, which actually does make some sense, right? I mean, we've all, like, bumped our leg on something, and you get a bruise and then you touch the bruise and you're like, oh, now I remember where I got that from. So, you know, experientially that makes sense, but how do we create that memory without being aware of it? And if we can have these situations of memory creation that we've forgotten about, that actually does sort of make some sense about how we forgot about, you know, realizations that we had in former lives or even past lives. 
So, all right, I, I think it's a fairly interesting problem. The other bigger problem about memory for Buddhism is that as soon as you start talking about memory and this continuity, you have a big problem about the continuity of self. Right, so I remember that this happened to me. But who's this me? What's this me? Who's this I that was back there five years ago that's still here now that had this experience or has is holding on to this memory? What is this memory that can be held on to? So the the personhood that's retained throughout time is really problematic for memory. So if we're trying to say that there's no self, there's no I, we're saying that there's a memory, a, a thing that can be attached to something, that's really problematic. Does anyone have any thoughts on that? Problematic in what sense? Problematic how? Well, a continuity of memories would show a continuity of personhood or continuity of something, continuity of existence. A continuity of sameness. So, so the problem with memory there is that it, it reinforces the illusion of inherent self? Potentially, yeah. I don't know that I necessarily go to that, you know, having a continuity of memory, because especially if there's another person involved and they experience the, the event with me, they would have a completely different version of, of whatever my version was. And so I see how, how really my memory is very selective in terms of what I actually remember about an event. It's not necessarily the right perspective at all the whole time. So you're sort of saying that what you remember and what actually happened are different? I'm saying that that if, if there was two people, and Lama used to say this, if, if he and I were both standing there looking at a tree, we would have completely different experiences of that tree and, and memories of looking at that tree. And I'd remember this part and he'd remember that part. And he'd see this part and I'd see that part. And it's, so it's really, it's, it's very, you know, it doesn't change the treeness of it, you know, whatever tree is, but, but we all have our own perceptions. And so we have to understand that our perceptions are, are kind of false to begin with. You know, it, it, it's not that there's nothing exists. It's just that, that the perceptions are not really real as we remember them. But how does the enduring enduring of your memory how does that change your or, or or how does that influence the you that was there that's here today does that have any influence on on your continuity oh i think of that i'm changing all the time and carrying memories doesn't affect that or having the ability to carry memories well, I, in fact, having the memory is helpful because I look back and I say, when I was 23 years old, I was doing this and I had this perspective and I see that I'm a completely different person than I was then. And, and, you know, I pay attention to different things now and I, and I know different things and I act differently and I talk differently. And I, you know, just like having the memory sort of helps support the, the impermanence of my self is not permanent. I don't know if that really helps you because I know you're specifically talking about memory, but I'm just, I'm getting a little bit, bit you know, thinking a bigger, slightly bigger picture w with what you do with that memory. No, that's actually, it, it's a problem of memory is that it, it, it tends to actually say that, well, I have these memories and these are memories of me. And even though you see change, 
you're seeing change within you. And that's the challenge. Is that you may see change, but it's change within you. I mean, there's certain things that are stored in my brain in, in the form of memories. And I, I do believe that memories are stored all over our brains. And it's like a filing cabinet and, and some things will trigger something else. And, and you can say, gee, I want to remember so-and-so's last name. And then you sit there and, and then about five seconds later, it finally comes up, you know. So it's like your, your, your brain will be working on it and it knows where to go find it in the filing system. Uh, you know, that's just a that's just a physical function of our brain, but it doesn't mean it's us. Yeah, I I think it's an interesting problem, and and I I don't have any good answers to this at all. I'm I'm just really curious about it, and I actually find it really curious that there's not much written about it. Well. Um, Honor. Yeah. The uh, I think memory may be included the three times past, present, and future. That may be where memory uh, is talked about in the Dharma. This morning I was reading the Abhidharma, talking about the self and the past and how the past holds the self as it holds uh, memory. Um, that also kind of shifted my self-consciousness. In what way? Well, if if self-consciousness is held in the past, then how how viable is it? Is it since it's not held in the present? Can you define what it meant by self-consciousness? Yes, the consciousness of a as a person, and and. Uh, that held as a collective or uh, you know me it's me me my i but if that's held in the past and not held in the past, then uh that changes uh, that changes who the i is yeah there's some Interesting discussion about that actually uh, in the one citation that uh, Jake Garfield gave me, which is chapter nine of the Bodhicara Vitara, um, which I am not at all uh, well versed in. Um, the only reading I've done is Transcendent Wisdom, and that's not very good. So, uh, you know, Susan's probably well more way more up to date on this than I am. Um, but it does go through sort of that a little bit um, through objections and stuff. Um, I think that the big challenge is when you start talking about memory is that you do get into the, the awareness and mindfulness and the different words that are used for memory. Um, and the recollective memory versus, you know, self and identification and reflexive memory um, and all those different terms that you have that separate out the different kinds of memory that you have, that there are, um, it, and you get some really interesting things that happen. Um, so, you know, I, I really appreciate that comment though, but I think it's a fascinating subject for sure that, yeah, I think there's a lot more that could be done. Um, I was actually hoping to eat some ice cream with you guys today, but because I can't be at home because my internet broke, <laughs> I can't do that. But are there any more questions or comments that maybe we could uh, 
Yeah, I have a question. Yeah, yeah. I, I, and I, I don't know exactly how this sits in the framework of what you're talking about, but is there any discussion or mention of memory in the body? Because we're talking about memory in the mind, but is it mind separate from physical body or or memory stored in the body? Because you have like <clears throat> as you were all talking about this, I was thinking about like for example, I have muscle memory when I play a musical instrument where it just, I don't even have to consciously remember, it just does it. So there's like unconscious action and it's like in my body, in my re, uh, uh, reaction, um, in my muscles and in my in everything. And then there's like, for example, um, I had an experience where I put on some sandals that I wore a year ago and I was right back in getting radiation treatment. Like I felt it in my body. Like I physically felt the the changes in my body putting the shoes on just for about, you know, 10 or 20 seconds. So then there's me giving me feedback of a memory. And then, then there's like experiences I've had where I've been in meditation sessions and um, someone's been doing like acupressure or they've been doing something where they've been touching my body. And I remember something like you talked about, we're not getting very deep into like past lives or things, but things that seem foreign to my life. So they're not something that I remember experiencing, but there's something that is being triggered somehow. So I don't know if it's imagination or I don't know if it's, you know, like, I don't know exactly where that's coming from. So like, um, I don't know if they talk about like the action of memory and where, like how, you know, how does it sit? Because in the body, that's the body, right? Regardless of how conscious I am of my existence of self. And like in, in, the, in the space that I'm in, I am separate from you physically, even though I understand the concept of emptiness. Right now, I am I'm physically separate. So there's something going on there, but I don't know if there's a different text or something that I'm unaware of, because again, I'm very green to all this. Um, that talks about that or discusses that kind of breakdown of the body relationship to this topic? I, I don't think so, but I think that um, there's one article in here that, uh, in the book that I'm actually sort of referring to is um, The Mirror of Memory. Um, it's edited by Janet Gautzo. Um it's got a lot of good articles and probably the only compilation that I was able to find that's published. Um, some of them are quite on point. But there's an article in here about Zochen, um, which is probably the closest thing that I can get to what you're sort of talking about, but not quite. Um, but I think probably if that sort of stuff is out there, it might actually be closer to like the yogic practices, right? like Saolong, um, those sorts of things, even even mudras, right? I mean, a lot of those things rely on repeated efforts um, that that are more physical rather than just more mental practices. That I would assume that. Like I said before, that if there's stuff about this, it's probably in, you know, teacher to student lineage sort of pith instructions or meditative practices or, you know, some things that just aren't widely available or researched yet. Um, not in the really big texts that are studied very often. I, I just don't have a much better answer for you right now, um, but, uh, I think that's a really great question. I know in Western science and Western philosophy, there's actually probably, well, I know that there's actually a lot more out there because that's something that Westerners like, right? We really like knowing about memory. We've studied it a lot. Um, and so, quite honestly, that literature is overwhelming. Um, there's a lot of information about you know, muscle memory and you know, somatic memory. 
Um, it's really fascinating. Um, so I think that's actually a, probably a really interesting place to start, but within Buddhist literature, um, you know, it's just a, a tough nut to crack, quite honestly. And that is from people who know way more than I do. So it's a great question. I'm gonna read the comments for a second, so. So can I ask in terms of your inquiry and your curiosity, what, what do you see as the practical application of, of this line of inquiry? Um, I mean, like in terms of meditation or in terms of um accessing behaviors that may be unconscious i find it i just find it interesting i think that when i had darshan last month um i had sort of a little question about, you know, well, you know, I enjoy shamatha, I enjoy sort of what I'm doing, why do I need to do any more of than what I'm doing now? Um, which is the wrong answer. Uh, and the response was really, well, because you need to be able to stabilize any realizations. And so sort of my inquiry after that was, what, is exa what exactly does that mean? And what that really meant was you need to be able to remember what was going on. You need to have that stability to be able, and memory is a part of that stability, right? Um, well, what does that mean within Buddhism? So that sort of line of inquiry on my, my own side brought me down that path of what exactly am I doing in meditation? What is the purpose of meditation for me at this point? Why am I going for it? Why do I want to do more? Why should I be doing more than what I'm doing now? Why should I put in more effort to this? Why should I give more energy to what I'm doing? Because I'm, you know, I'm enjoying what I'm doing now. Um, why should I push myself to do any more? Uh, and that was the response was, because you need better stability, you need more concentration, you need, you know, memory has a part in that. So I started to sort of pull those strings apart and this became one of them. And so this is just a line of inquiry that I came to of, well, what does memory within Buddhism mean? So, Here we are. And uh, apparently it's, you know, a fascinating subject that I find fascinating that uh, is really difficult to find much on, in English at least. Or, you know, even for researchers who have access to other languages and to piles and piles of books in other countries. So and which is really pretty interesting. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Any other uh, questions or comments 
compliance? Well, thanks, Connor. I think it, it um, I mean, that's part of observing our mind and understanding how our mind works. And, and that's just, that's one thing that is kind of, uh, kind of a big topic in a way. It's interesting that's not very much written about it, but, you know, because we experience it all the time. So that's part of understanding. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, all right, well, uh, a couple of announcements real quick. Um, Tuesday at 6.30, we have uh, Sangha chat. Uh, we also have Tuesday night meditation at 6.30. Uh, Lamala is speaking at the Buddha Dharma study group tomorrow at 7, 7, 7.30, I don't know. Someone should look up at what time that is. I forget at the moment. Um, Wednesday, yeah, 7.00. Okay, Wednesday is uh, Wednesday night meditation. Thursday is sort of combined Vajrasattva and moon practice starting at 8.30. Friday is Tung Len. Saturday morning is just Chen Rezi this, this week. Next week again will be Steps on the Buddhist Path. How did that go yesterday, Susan? Um, it went well. It was um, our first session, and we were sort of figuring out the protocols and um, you know how it is that we're gonna we're gonna interact with each other. So yeah, it went really well. So thank Great. you. All right. Um, and Jeanette just sent in a comment. Uh, according to the Padajali father of yoga, yoga is yoke, body, and mind. The Chitta Virti, no. yeah, I can't say that, uh, which means still in the mind. Yeah. <clears throat> yoga is uh, to yoke body and mind according to uh, the father of yoga, Patanjali. And throughout these uh, exercises, yo yogic postures, we reach uh, stilling the mind, which is, he, he says in Sanskrit, sit shiti vriti narodaha. So it means stilling the mind. This is what it means. Yeah. So through a kinesthetic uh, um, postures, uh, we get to uh, stilling the mind by these memories of uh, repeating these postures. Uh, we, the ultimate goal is to still the mind. This is, I thought about this when you, I'm not knowledgeable about the, <laughs> what you're talking about, but it reminded me, uh, I'm not sure if this relates to what you're talking about. Yeah. Um... That does actually. That's uh, it's it's definitely on point with the the kinetic um, movement that uh, we were talking about earlier. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, I don't think there are any other announcements for the week. Um, do you want to do prayers, Matthew? All right. So I forget. Should I do? Um... Do I do closing prayers and then the prayers that save Shakyamuni or vice yeah. versa? Let's do them that way. Okay. Dedication. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good, all powerful chenrezig, tensing gyatso. Please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. 
May all migrators achieve happiness and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Lo Song, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones, merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators, please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion. Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom. Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras. Tsongkhapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages. Losong Dragpa, I make request at your holy feet. The verses that saved Sakya from sickness, a prayer for pacifying the fear of disease. May all the diseases that disturb the mind of sentient beings and which result from karma and temporary conditions, such as the harms of spirits, illness, and the elements. Yeah, oh, excuse me. Thank you for letting me know. Never occur throughout the realms of this land. May whatever sufferings arise due to life-threatening diseases, which like a butcher leading an animal to the slaughter, separate the body from the mind in a mere instant, never occur throughout the realms of this world. May all the embodied beings remain unharmed by acute, chronic, and infectious diseases, the mere names of which can inspire the same terror as would be felt in the jaws of Yama, Lord of Death. May the 8,000 classes of harmful obstructors, the 360 evil spirits that harm without warning, the 404 types of disease and so forth never cause harm to any embodied being. May whatever suffering arise due to disturbances in the four elements, depriving the body and mind of every pleasure, be totally pacified and may the body and mind have radiance and power and be endowed with long life, good health and well-being. By the compassion of the gurus and the three jewels, the power of the dakinis, dharma protectors and guardians, and by the strength of the infallibility of karma and its results, may these many dedications and prayers be fulfilled as soon as they are made. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Connor. Thanks, Connor. Thank you, Connor. I really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you, Cynthia. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks, Hillary. Thanks, Connor. Thanks, Ashley. Thanks, everyone. Good to see you. Yeah, you too. Matthew, will you turn off the recording?